I'm, I'm here today with uh, Captain Charlie Plum, United States Navy retired. Um, he's a fellow Midwestern farm kid. Uh, unlike me, uh, Captain, Blum had, or Captain Plum had a dream of becoming an aviator and he lived his dream in the Navy. After graduating from the Naval Academy, he reported to Miramar Naval Air Station in San Diego, where he flew the at first adversarial flights in the development of what would become the Navy Fighter Weapons School, which we currently know as Top Gun. Uh, Captain Plum went on to 74 successful combat missions in an F-4 Phantom in Vietnam, and that included more than 100 carrier landings. Uh, what I want to talk to Captain Plum about today is what happened on his 75th mission. Captain Plum was shot down over Hanoi. He was taken prisoner. He was tortured. And he spent the next 2,103 days in an eight by eight foot cell as a prisoner of war. And before I go any further, Captain Plum, on behalf of DAV and the veterans we represent, thank you for your courageous service and sacrifice. And thank you for taking the time to speak with me today. Rob, thank you very much uh, for what you do. I'm uh, pleased to be with you and uh, proud to speak to fellow veterans. And I, I, would, I would like to, for you, if you could, to, to jump right in and, and tell me about those more than 2,100 days uh, as a prisoner of war. It's uh, a little bit tough to put it in a few, a few sentences or a minute or two, but uh, basically the 2,103 days that I spent there, and incidentally, I wasn't always in that the late foot, late foot cell. That was sort of the average size cell, but a, a lot of things tra transpired over those years. <clears throat> but um, it was, uh, as we say in aviation, uh, you know, uh, hours and hours and hours of boredom uh, uh, punctuated by moments of extreme terror. <laughs> and so um, it was you know, a lot of time to spend uh, isolated, but then I think it sort of relates to what we're, we're doing today in our isolation. Um, because we were cut off from the rest of the world. We were even cut off from our fellow POWs. Most of the time, well, all of the time I spent in isolation, uh, some of the time in solitary confinement. The, 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 um, and not as much as more, some of the more senior guys, uh, the, the record was four and a half years, Jeremiah Denton, in, uh, in solitary confinement. So, so that's sort of the, I think the parallel of what we're doing today is in this isolated period of time, how, how do we survive this and even thrive because of it? Well, the first, first few days, that, but back to the, to the prison scene, uh, was filled with, with beatings and torture and um, uh, no medical care, of course, for months. Um, I was bleeding from four open wounds. Um, I... I got really skinny. I figure I was down about 115 pounds and I weighed 175 this morning. So uh, I, and it seemed like every cell in my body seemed to hurt. I remember not, not being able to blink my eyes without something hurting somewhere on my body. It was ridiculous. Um, and so it was, you know, by far the, the, the worst pain that I, that I had ever seen. But then after the torture, tossed in this little cell and uh and then then the mental uh the mental anguish began i felt i, I felt very um um i felt very guilty about having get, given in to the enemy you know i mean fighter pilots are not supposed to give up you know that's that's not in the dna dna of most military people and i had given up and uh i I, you know, even wondered if I ever could go back to my home country and, and face my family and friends and, and fellow uh, military uh, pals, n knowing that I'd failed in my mission so miserably. And, and I think this is, this is somewhat common, not just in military life, but in everyday life. When, when we try so hard at something, you know, in this situation we're in right now, you know, we had a job and working hard and, and gaining uh, a little bit of savings and suddenly we're out of work and we're confined to our one room in the house and we got kids that are home from school and, you know, or, or, or maybe an, uh, an unmarried uh, a daughter that moves in with her two kids and, you know, it, 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 it's tough. So I grappled then with this 
feeling of depression and guilt, you know, for a long time until I finally got communication with one of the guys in the cell next to me, uh, Bob Shoemaker. Uh, Shu had been in prison for two years when I showed up. And so he, uh, he was a fount of knowledge and wisdom. And the first thing he told me when I, when I confessed to him that I had failed, you know, that I, that I had, uh, that given in, that, that given up to the enemy, uh, he said, hell, everybody did that. None of us was as strong as we wanted to be. So pull up your big boy pants. We've got a war to fight here. He said, our senior leadership in this prison camp is the finest you will ever see. He said, you've just joined the best team you will ever play on, ever. They've, they've redefined our mission. We're not, not on the defensive. And I'll tell you this, when I, when I heard that, is, he's passing this uh, to me on, in, in a code, tapping on a wall. Uh, in, in this case, he was tugging on a wire in this secret code that we had developed. And, uh, and so it was very slow. You know, the communication was very slow, but it was very deliberate. You know, he said, um, uh, he said, we're not on the defensive. And I remember, you know, <laughs> stepping away from that wall and looking around in my little prison cell, <laughs> you know, uh, eight foot by eight feet and, and, uh, and not a book to read or a window to look at or a pencil or a piece of paper, you know, a, a two gallon bucket in the corner was my toilet. I mean, it was pretty grim situations. Uh, and I'm thinking to myself, I'm not on the defensive, huh? <laughs> well, <laughs> he said, no, our, our leadership has redefined this. We have a mission. We are military guys and we are warriors and we will pursue this war till our last dying breath. Well, it, it, it still seemed to be pretty, pretty silly for me as a junior officer to have all these senior guys down in the end cell block you know, uh, wanting me to conform to their, to their military regimen, <laughs> but it worked. We set up uh, this, this community by the communication and built this team and so that we could face the enemy with, you know, with solidarity. And it was really interesting because we, you know, obviously we, we weren't exactly on the point of the spear, you know, we, we weren't uh, shooting down airplanes or dropping bombs anymore, but oh, by the way, just that feeling of unity and power that we had within that prison camp brought us all together and really uh, allowed us to come home uh, in great shape. What, which of those aspects do you feel like was the most important? Was it the that you had that community or that you had a mission, or, or is it a combination of both? It sounds like a combination of both. Well, that's a good question. It was absolutely vital that we have a mission, a purpose in life. And I know, you know, one of the things that troubles me the most now is all of our veterans that are committing suicide. And so I, I, I work on that. I'm, I'm involved in a, a couple of different organizations that, that seem to, uh, to, uh, to have a handle on it. <clears throat> um, but I've often felt that, that having a mission is, is so vital. While we're in the military, you know, we got a purpose. Uh, we know the purpose. If you don't know the purpose, ask your drill instructor. He'll tell you the purpose. No question about that. But, you know, we, we all have this, this reason um, uh, to, to put on the uniform. Well, when guys retire, take off that uniform, suddenly they don't have that same purpose anymore. You know, they, and, and they sort of flounder around, I, I think, looking for, uh, a reason, you know, uh, uh, to, to get up in the morning, you know, a reason to, to go to work or to, or, or to read a book or to take care of your loved ones. Um, and so purpose was vital. Now, the, pur the, the purpose would not have uh, been effective without that communication. Communication was vital, not just because we were passing around military secrets or escape plans or all that stuff but the communication served as a lifesaver just by validating the very existence of, a, of another prisoner of war in those cells when we were alone and it was dark uh it, you, you know you couldn't you couldn't tell green from from red in in a lot of those prison camps 
It was just that dark. It was a dungeon. And in that situation, you, you lose track. You don't know what's a, a real memory, what's a hallucination of a memory. You, you, you don't know sometimes if you're even alive or dead. There was nothing to tell me for sure that I was a living human being. So the tapping on a wall or the tugging on a wire, to have somebody tug back or tap back, you know, we'd use the old shaving haircut, that, 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 that. And the other guy would go, that, that. And, and just, I mean, that, it was revolutionary. It was, it was like, I'm alive. Somebody's responding to something I am doing physically. And then the second part was, hey, somebody cares. Somebody cares enough to risk their life, you know, to help me. And so, so that combination, I think, as you, as you pointed out, purpose and then the unity in the, within the communication really were two of the major things that allowed my survival. I, uh, we were talking about before we started recording, uh, I first, uh, I know I've, I heard you on, on uh, Jocko Willink's podcast uh, in twice, as you informed me, you corrected me, and, uh, but also on a recent, most recently on a, on a Reddit, uh, which is a, a website on there, what's called an AMA or an Ask Me Anything. And so many of the questions that were thrown at you were obviously from men and women, I would say probably young men and women who have not served. Uh, so have had not had the, the type of um, training and experience that I had as a Marine, you had as a as, um, graduate of Annapolis and Naval Aviator and, and all the rest. Um, with this civilian military ga uh, gap being so large, larger than probably it ever has before, certainly in this country, what, why is it important for you to, do you feel, to get out and get this message uh, about your experience out in front of these young men? Well, the, 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 the message, I think, is pretty universal. Um, anybody that has had, had a challenge in your life, which is all of us, uh, can identify not necessarily with the drama of being a prisoner of war, but with the response that you have when you come into a challenge within your life. Everybody has had fear, you know, everybody's had frustration, everybody has had loneliness and, and felt that you failed at something. And so there's a, there's a real connection, I think, between my story and, and, the, and the story of any any military guy or gal uh, because the, the, while the circumstance may be different, the personal response, you know, the human emotion is a largely the same. And I am convinced that you can be in just as much of a prison camp going through a divorce or losing a job or for that matter, contracting a coronavirus. Uh, I, I, I call it the, the eight inch prison, you know, that myself, was eight feet long and eight feet wide. And I'm convinced that for the first several months, I was in a prison far worse than that was the eight inches, eight inch box, you know, I had over my head. It was a mental, it was a mental game. So that eight inch space between my ears uh, really was the, was the challenge. And, and I needed to escape that challenge. <clears throat> but it was interesting that, and that asked me anything, uh, Reddit uh, thing that, so some of the, of course, you never know the age or background or political leanings of, of anybody who asks you these questions. And, but it was really kind of interesting. Uh, I got this question of, um, uh, do, do you play Terraria? Okay, I think that was Terraria. And, well, this is a video game, okay, that I'd never heard of. And, uh, and so I, I, had, I had to Google this Terraria thing to tell them, no, I, no, I don't play Terraria. So, but a lot of interesting questions. You're going to come out of one of those a gamer one of these days. Uh, yeah, I'm sure. You're going to end up with a Xbox or Switch or whatever the kids are playing. Um, <laughs> yeah. can, can you tell me, uh, again, some of these men and women obviously ha haven't served and, and so few uh, have been through the hell that, that you experienced. Um, are there tips and, and, and tricks maybe for escaping that, that eight inch prison that you talked about? Do you have any, that, anything that you could pass along, especially in these trying times? Absolutely. And we've already talked about a, cu a couple of them. Find a purpose. If you don't have a purpose in life, you know, you're, you're losing out and, and, uh, and probably going downhill. 
Uh, and the purpose can be very, very simple, you know, uh, find a way to serve. Now, I know that most of your, <clears throat> of your audience are, are veterans. And I would say just because you took off the uniform doesn't mean that you don't still owe your country uh, a debt of gratitude, you know, a way to serve. And that does a couple of things for you. I think when you are in the service of others, you're actually helping yourself because you have a purpose. You have this, this reason to live. So find a purpose. Communicate. Uh, you know, uh, it, the, we so often assume that other people understand what we're thinking or what's in our heart. And, uh, you know, it, it, it's like gratification. Well, yes, you may, you may appreciate something that your husband does or your wife does or even your kids does. And you think, well, they know I love them. I don't have to tell them. You know, they know that I appreciate they're making that meal for me or, or you know, washing the car for me. But, but talk to them. You know, I, I'm, I'm convinced that, <clears throat> that um, gratification uh, in silence or gratification without a verbal or, or even physical uh, action is, is empty. It's not really gratification at all because it doesn't go anywhere if you don't say something. So, uh, so I, I think that would be the second thing. Now, communicate with people, uh, be, have an attitude of gratitude and, and serve. You know, I, I think that service uh, to others without asking anything in return you know, it's that, it's that servant leadership, I think, that we, that, that we, that have been in the military know full well uh, that you can be a leader without, uh, you know, without a, a bar on your, on, on your, uh, on your shoulder. Uh, in fact, most of the best leaders I ever, I had, you know, were, were some of the younger, uh, even uh, less experienced people that just knew right from wrong and weren't, and weren't afraid to, to say right from wrong. And so uh, be a servant leader, communicate, and uh, find yourself a purpose. Well, it sounds like you, you, know, you did all of that uh, after, um, after getting out of that, that, that hellish prison camp or, uh, and you escaped the life of POW, you were able uh, to go on to have uh, you know, more service, much more service. You retired after 28 years uh, of service and you continue to lead today uh, and you inspire as a, a public speaker. Um, and I just want to, again, on behalf of, of DAV, uh, Captain Plum, I want to thank you uh, for your time today. Uh, I want to thank you for your leadership. And I, 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 most of all, I want to thank you for continuing to get out there and tell your story, uh, especially during these trying times when I, I feel like it's so important. Thanks for that, Rob. Uh, I, I, I feel, you know, I feel a dedication, a service. Um, as, as you mentioned, I, I speak for a living. That, that's what I've done. I've had all my speeches canceled. And so, I, you know, I've gotten on uh, the Zoom circuit. <laughs> and so, and I do a, a, a daily video, as a matter of fact, about the connection. They're just short one-minute videos about the connection. The first one I did was on toilet paper. <laughs> and and it, was, it became pretty popular. Perfect. Oh, Perfect. I, I bet, I bet it's very know, popular. I, it was crazy. It was crazy. You know, the, 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 the way people just went over the moon because they didn't have any toilet paper. And, and I made the comment on this, on this daily video that, I, that my, uh, my uh, tender tiny touche had not been touched by a, a sheet of a Charmin for 2,103 days. <laughs> I'd get over it. <laughs> <laughs> and perfect. also, you know, I've, I've, I've written my, my autobiography, my book, I'm No Hero, and, uh, and, and that seems to uh, strike a chord with people in, in today's uh, isolation. And, Captain uh, Plum, where can, where can folks find that, that information uh, from? Or sure, website? My, my, web, my website, charlieplum.com, it's C-H-A-R-L-I-E, and P-L-U-M-B.com, charlieplum.com. And that's got, you know, that's got my Instagram and and uh, LinkedIn and all those uh, connections on it, as well as a bunch of videos and uh, of the stories that I that I tell on my speeches. And you can you can uh, you can order a book from there. And I, I autograph every book that I that I send out of my office here. So well, I, I know where I'll be going after we get off this interview. Um, again, <laughs> Captain Plum, thank you for your service. Thank you for your time today, uh, and, and best of luck to you during during these these crazy times. 
thanks again for what you do and, and all of the, your DAV members. I really respect and appreciate you and, and salute you.